Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar brought to you by the De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub and the De La Salle University Department of Lit Literature. The title of our webinar is Of Books and Pathogens, Southeast Asia in the Eyes of Empire with Dr. Dina Roma of De La Salle University and Dr. Farish Noor of the Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. To deliver the welcome remarks, I have the pleasure to introduce the chairperson of the Department of Literature of De La Salle University, Dr. Janvive L. Aseno. Good afternoon, the LSU administrators, colleagues, our dear undergraduate and graduate students, guests and friends. Welcome to the webinar of Books and Pathogens, Southeast Asia in the Eyes of Empire, featuring Dr. Farish Noor of Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and our very own university fellow, Dr. Dina Roma of the Literature Department, together with Dr. Carlos Piocos as discussant. This is the first of the many possible collaborations of the Department of Literature with our Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, led by our historian and scholar, Dr. Fernando Santiago. Many thanks, sir. This webinar brings us to time as history and history as stories written by white men and therefore historical time and historical narrative as culture, ways of seeing and doing, and thus this engagement as necessary intervention for one in the crisis of knowledge in the knowledge production of our shared and interconnected past of Western imperialism and and colonialism, and we are privileged this afternoon to have the astute reading or critique of our literary and cultural scholars in language pleasurable for moments of recognition, which is to say, we hope you will be inspired to start or to continue with your own investigation of Southeast Asian narratives, especially with what was and is told about us. So Dr. Noor, thank you, and we look forward to have more engagement with you. Thank you everyone for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Happy listening. Thank you, Dr. Asenho. Before we proceed, let me read again the title of our webinar, which is Of Books and Pathogens, Southeast Asia in the Eyes of Empire. The webinar examines how the production of books in the age of empire was a vital mode in the historical and ideological construction of the region. Dr. Farish Noor will discuss his recent works, America and Southeast Asia, 1800 to 1900 before the pivot and data gathering in Southeast Asia, 1800 to 1900 framing the other. Dr. Rama's talk will extend the historical timeline to do a discourse analysis on the book, The Isles of Fear, the Truth About the Philippines, published in 1925 by American journalist Catherine Mayo. The Isles of Fear was written up as a public health report that later on was acclaimed to have delayed the granting of Philippine independence by the American colonial government for another two decades. So we shall now proceed to the lectures. Our first speaker is Associate Professor at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies Nanyang Technological University. His latest works include Racial Difference and the Colonial Wars of Southeast Asia, 1800 to 1900, edited with Peter Carey and to be published in 2021. Data Collecting in Colonial Southeast Asia, Framing the Other, published in 2020. Before the Pivot, America's Encounters with Southeast Asia, 1800 to 1900, published in 2018, and Discourse Construction of Southeast Asia in 19th Century Colonial Capitalist Discourse, published in 2016, all by the Amsterdam University Press. He is a senior fellow of the DLSU Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Farish A. Noor. Thank you very much, uh, Fernie. And again, I would like to uh, begin by uh, tendering my thanks to the organizers of this event. I'm really very, very happy to be with all of you uh, today. And in particular, I'm happy to be speaking together with my friend uh, Dina, uh, whose interest in uh, colonial era literature is uh, something very close to my own heart as well. So once again, thank you very much. I'm so happy to see that so many of you are here, particularly on a Saturday afternoon where we could be doing other things, but I'm glad that there is a, a 
considerable interest in the subject of you know the discursive construction the literary construction of southeast asia in 19th century colonial discourse uh, now as mentioned earlier by uh, um, uh, professor genevieve of course these debates that we are having now are hugely timely and they are very important they come at a particular time where once again uh, our region, Southeast Asia, is at the crossroads uh, of all kinds of geopolitical and geoeconomic contestations. And for us who live in Southeast Asia, we who are Southeast Asians, the question of who we are, what we are, what we aspire to, and what we hope for the future, these are existential questions that are very pertinent to, to our present state of affairs. But they boil down to, again, the question of what is Southeast Asia, which as we all know, was itself a historical construct that, like it or not, we have inherited from this long colonial encounter that we have had with the Western world. Initially, the empires of Western Europe, and lately, uh, later, um, with the emerging, you know, America that becomes a Pacific power from the mid 19th century onwards, and also uh, Imperial Japan from the second half of the 19th century. So today, I suppose we are, we are looking at the writings that were produced um, during, you know, this period, the 19th century for me, is, in my estimation, perhaps the most important century for us, because it witnessed several things happening at the same time. Firstly, the near total, near absolute colonization of Southeast Asia by various Western empires. Two, the enormous gap of technology and critically capital and military technology, which meant that Southeast Asians were no longer able to control not only our territories, our land territories and our maritime territories, but crucially not able to define ourselves because we had lost out in, an, in another important domain, which is the battle of ideas, the, 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 the struggle for self-determination in the domain of knowledge production. So allow me to, to, to begin with you know, the, a simple premise that has been made very well in the writings of Kern, uh, who looked at the uh, somewhat similar modalities of colonial knowledge production in India. And Kern, in his works, you know, looks at how the British colonization of the Indian subcontinent was a project that was really undergirded by knowledge production. Empires are not simply, you know, battleships and gunboats and tanks and guns. Long before the actual acts of violence, there has to be the discursive construction of the other as the enemy, as the savage, as the community that needs to be saved from itself, what have you. So Kern's emphasis on the modalities of knowledge production and the way in which he centers writing, scientific writing, literary writing, fictional writing, media writing at the center of empire is something that I think is very, very important, particularly for those of us who work in this, you know, intersection between political history, political theory, political science, literary studies, and cultural studies. It's the production of knowledge uh, that we need to look at. Now, because I want to really, uh, uh, you know, um, pave the way for, for Dina's presentation that comes after this, allow me to do a little bit of stage setting. And before we move on to, I think, the very interesting discussion about the discursive construction of Filipino society in American writings, I would like to perhaps offer some comparisons when we look at the history of colonial writings uh, on other parts of Southeast Asia, notably the Dutch East Indies and the British Burma and British Malaya in the 19th century. And for this, I'm basically going to do uh, a kind of idea tracing or a genealogy of ideas uh, by looking at the writings of both British authors and some American authors who wrote extensively about Southeast Asia from the late 18th uh, to the 19th centuries. And from the outset, uh, let me allude to the fact that basically what we are talking about here is 
the evolution of confirmation bias uh, and the emergence of the colonial echo chamber, how these echo chambers uh, uh, eventually developed through a process of continuous writing by various authors who would constantly refer back, refer back, refer back to their fellow countrymen. And by the way, it's almost always, almost always men yeah, who are writing because we have to remember there's also a gender aspect to, to colonization and, and you know, imperial domination. So if we look at the writings produced by British authors, you know, a, a few of them obviously stand out. It's very interesting that until today, if you were to visit uh, any department of Southeast Asian studies in some Western or American universities, uh, if you were to look at their reading lists uh, or in their curriculum, the syllabus, um, when reading about uh, countries such as Indonesia, one might not be all that surprised to suddenly find uh, among all these books, you know, the writings of people like um, Stamford Raffles or John Crawford. Now, for those who are not familiar, uh, Raffles was the British colonial uh, administrator of the East India Company, who became Lieutenant Governor of Java during the British occupation of Java. And his book, the book that he produced, A History of Java, The History of Java, mind, mind you, The History of Java, published in 1817, is still, oddly enough, regarded as a classic work, a work that somehow encapsulates the totality of Javanese society and history or what have you. And this we find reproduced even in popular writings. If you look at, uh, if you, uh, you know, were to go to a bookshop and you buy The Rough Guide to Indonesia, which is uh, basically a book for tourists, at the end, there's a long reading list. And among the suggested readings on Java is Stanford Raffles, the history of Java, which for me as a historian and, and someone who studies, you know, uh, colonial knowledge production is somewhat startling because this was a book written at the height of British imperial power. And when Britain had occupied Java for, for a, a period from 1811 to 1816, and in so many ways, it's a colonial text. But when we look at the writings of Raffles, we see an enormous amount of, you know, intertextuality and cross-referencing because these colonial writers, the British colonial writers, and many of them were themselves functionaries of the British East India Company, uh, made famous, of course, by Johnny Depp in the Pirates of the Caribbean. But, you know, they were all functionaries of the East India Company, and they were in Southeast Asia with the simple stated objective of colonizing Southeast Asia for the sake of capital material gains. So men like Raffles, like John Anderson, like John Crawford, who were then, you know, at the forefront, the spearhead of the colonial penetration of Southeast Asia, were not only warrior merchants, but also merchant scholars. And all of these authors that I've mentioned, Raffles, Crawford, Anderson, um, wrote within a very small community of like-minded colonial capitalists for whom William Marsden was, you know, the great doyen, you know, the, 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 the man who, whose history of Sumatra was perhaps one of the first, um, you know, important writings on Southeast Asia written in the English language in the 18th century. So we see a lot of cross-referencing that takes place. You know, Raffles refers to Marsden, Crawford refers to Marsden, Anderson refers to Marsden, and they refer to each other in their works. What stands out for those of us who study these texts um, closely by going through the footnotes and the annotations and the appendices in them is how this body of knowledge, you know, was at the one hand and on the one hand, you know, a singular enterprise where the individual author is writing and collecting data, but also a collective enterprise where any supposition, any assertion, any claim made about, say, the Filipinos or the Javanese or the Malays would be supported by claims made by other authors who occupied a very similar subject position as them. They were all company men, they were all colonialists, they were all colonial capitalists. So we see a mutually reinforcing, you know, uh, echo chamber emerging there. And this is not unique to the writings of 
British authors uh, in the book that uh, that uh, uh, Fernando has alluded to earlier, my book on on the early American encounters with Southeast Asia from 1800 to 1900. Um, I look at a succession of American authors. Um, by the way, if you're interested in the book, it's not really a history of American political involvement. It's a history of American writing on Southeast Asia by a succession of American authors who were at that time, you know, newly arrived in Southeast Asia at the time when America itself had just arrived on, you know, the, the stage of international politics as a Western country that was culturally Western, but at the same time, a young republic that wanted to emphasize its political and ideological differences with the old continent of Europe. So it's very interesting to see how in the first half of the 19th century, when uh, these first American merchants and traders and diplomats came to Southeast Asia, uh, a con uh, an idea that is that was continually being emphasized by all of these people, particularly the diplomats, was that, yes, America is Western, but we are not like them. We are not like those British. We are not like those Spanish. We are not like those French. We are not imperialists. That is actually historically correct. The um, slide to 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 imperialism, America's embrace of imperialism comes much later in the 19th century. Uh, and this is what I chronicle in, in, in my book uh, through the writings of these American authors. But let's look at the American authors who you know, began to write about Southeast Asia long before America's direct intervention and you know, uh, tragic conquest of the Philippines. Americans were already very active in places like Burma, um, Siam, Thailand, um, Sumatra, and attempting to enter the markets of you know, um, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, what would be eventually um, um, uh, French Indochina, and also uh, the markets of Java, then held by the Dutch. So we have early American writings by people like Jeremiah Reynolds uh, and Francis Warriner, uh, John Fitch Taylor, who, though they were consciously aware of the fact that they were Americans abroad, Americans in Southeast Asia, and consciously aware of the fact that they did not want to be seen as, you know, being somewhat similar to the Europeans who were, you know, basically, you know, uh, growing imperial powers, but notwithstanding, you know, this desire to carve a distance between America and Europe, we really see how these Americans, uh, through their own writings, ended up reproducing very, very similar stereotypes of Southeast Asians from an American-centric lens. So in my study of the American authors, I, I've done what I did with the British authors. And basically, I've, I've attempted to trace the similarities and the genesis and the evolution of ideas that were shared between these American authors uh, who were writing about Sumatra, writing about uh, Java, writing about Thailand, Siam, writing about uh, um, Indochina, and, and how in a very short space of time, within this 100-year period, within the 19th century, there emerged then a body of American knowledge about Southeast Asia, which is very American-centric. And all these authors, one by one, invariably, again, fall back, fall back, fall back on earlier opinions, earlier views of Southeast Asia written by their fellow Americans. So by the time we get to Walter Gibson writing in the 1850s, by the time we get to um, Albert Bigmore writing in 1869, these authors are again referring back to earlier American perceptions of Southeast Asia. So in both the body of British colonial writings and in the body of American colonial writings, we see the emergence of distinct echo chambers where Americans are writing about Southeast Asia by referring to other American writings about Southeast Asia, where British men are writing about Southeast Asia by referring to other British writings about Southeast Asia. Now, this brings me to, to what, I, what, you know, the, some of my concluding observations here. Why does this matter to us? We might ask, rightly, yeah, why should we 
Southeast Asians living in 2020, which has been a difficult year for all of us, why should we even be bothered about these American writings and British writings in the 19th century? After all, Raffles is dead. Crawford is dead. Marsden's dead. So why are we still reading these writings? Well, there are a number of reasons, and I'll try to sum them up uh, one by one. One, we've never left the 19th century. We have never left the 19th century. The political realities of Southeast Asia today are colonial realities. Yeah, our borders are colonial borders, and we are still trapped in a geopolitical, geoeconomic contestation, which in so many ways, you know, uh, bears the hallmarks of, you know, these historical events in the past. And these events continue to inform, continue to inform, continue to inform the way we understand ourselves today. The very fact that we are using the term Southeast Asia, which is not a Southeast Asian idea, is living testimony to the fact that we've never really left the shadow of empire. But crucially, particularly for people like Dina and myself, you know, who, like I said, work in this interesting intersection between literary critique, literature studies, and colonial history and political history. These writings, I think, you know, remind us that writing is a powerful exercise. Writing is an act of power to be able to write about another community, another society, is an exercise of power over that community because we <clears throat> then can actually, you know, define that community on our terms. Now, when that happens, what do we see in, in these writings that take place? In so many ways, <clears throat> I think the echo chambers that emerged uh, in the 19th century demonstrate, you know, what Rana Kabani calls, you know, the, the emergence of an imperial body of discourse, of knowledge, where, as she notes, the colonial writer <clears throat> of the 19th century, when writing about the colonized other, is not writing for the other. In other words, Raffles History of Java was not written for the benefit of the Javanese. Um, the American writings on Sumatrans, Walter Gibson's writings on the people of Palembang and Jambi, were not written for the sake of the people of Palembang and Jambi. These writings were, write, were written for the sake of their respective audiences back home. And this is Rana Kabani's important point, where she says that the colonial writer, or the writer of the colonial era, writes with the knowledge that behind him is the weight of an entire empire that is supporting him. And so we need to ask ourselves, you know, as we do literary analysis, how do we read these books? How does one read Raffles today? How does one read Gibson today? How does one read Bigmore today? For people like Raffles, Crawford, Gibson, Bigmore, Warriner, these are Western authors writing primarily for a Western audience. They were writing for their national readerships back home. Raffles' History of Java is basically a company report written for the benefit of the East India Company, but also for his fellow Englishmen. It's, it's uh, also very interesting when you read these books and you look at the acknowledgements at the beginning, often they are dedicated to, you know, they are leaders or masters or rulers back home. Uh, Crawford's book, for instance, is, was dedicated to King George. Raffles' book was dedicated to the Prince Regent. So we see then a kind of internal dynamic at work here where British authors are writing about Southeast Asia, but for a British readership. American authors are writing about Southeast Asia, but for an American readership. And if that be the case, and I think that is the case, if that be the case, then in so many ways, when we Southeast Asians reread these texts critically yeah, and with a, with a view of understanding you know, what was actually happening in the, in the process of production of knowledge, what we are really studying is basically the process of empire building. And this leads me to, to my, my, my next point. I see these texts as confessional texts. They're confessional texts in the sense that when these British authors in the 18th century or 19th century, or when these American authors in the 18th century or the 19th century were writing about Southeast Asia, in so many ways, 
they were really projecting their views, their culturally, historically perspective. Uh, 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 specific views of what they thought Southeast Asians were like or what Southeast Asia was. So in so many ways, these writings are about them. As I read Stanford Raffles' History of Java today, I don't find Java in there, but I find a lot of Raffles. So I read Stanford Raffles' History of Java, not as a history of Java, but rather as a history of the East India Company and of British colonial intervention in Southeast Asia. So we then, as Southeast Asian scholars and as Southeast Asian readers, can, I believe, you know, attempt a deconstruction and a, a, an internal critique of this long colonial legacy from within. We no longer have to go to the West to study the West or the history of the West for the simple reason that the West came to us. And the legacy of that encounter is found in these books that have, in so many ways, framed our part of the world in terms that were often debilitating and often compromising um, to our ancestors. But for us today, present day scholars of Southeast Asia, particularly those of us who are very much uh, you know, um, drawn to the project of decolonizing knowledge, these works are treasure troves they contain, you know, not only an enormous amount of data, but they also contain a very vivid accounting of how Southeast Asia was seen by non-Southeast Asians. And so I believe that, you know, and this is what I try to do in my work, we can and we should still continue reading these, uh, you know, uh, European and American authors, but from a Southeast Asian lens instead. I mean, decolonization doesn't simply mean removing the vestiges of, you know, colonial thought or ideas or biases or prejudices from, from the body of knowledge, but also turning the tables around, turning the telescope around, and rather than, you know, being scrutinized to turn the lens around to scrutinize the scrutinizer. And so, for me, one of the major domains where effective decolonization can and should take place is actually in the realm of ideas as ideas uh, ideas that were actually you know uh, uh, presented and developed and evolved in the form of writing and that's why for me these colonial era uh, writings are hugely important particularly today when we are still laboring you know uh, with many of these uh, you know, jaundiced stereotypes and perceptions about who and what we are, um, this recovers, this allows us to recover both academic agency, intellectual agency, and historical agency in the process of redefining these works, not as accurate depictions of Southeast Asia, but rather telling or confessional texts that tell us a lot about how Southeast Asia was seen by the colonial eye. And so in a sense of, uh, rather than rejecting these texts, because I know there's been a lot of debate now about, you know, in the, in, in the sphere of decolonization of knowledge, uh, with some people saying, let's not read these books anymore. Uh, for me, there's every reason to continue reading these books because it is in the critique of these books. And I think this is what Dina will be doing right, right after me. It is in this critique of these books so that we recover agencies that were lost. We recover histories that were lost. We recover voices and identities that were lost. But above all, above all, we reveal the colonizing power of knowledge when it is developed within that colonial echo chamber. Um, so with that, I think I'll, I'll stop here. And uh, I'm sure, like the rest of you, I'm eager to see um, uh, Dina uh, continue with the argument. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Farish Noor. Our next speaker is a poet by vocation and a literary and cultural studies scholar by obligation. She is university fellow and professor of literature and creative writing at De La Salle University, Manila. She is the author of three award-winning books of poetry, a Feast of Origins published in, published in 2004, which won the country's National Book Award for Poetry, Geographies of Light published in 2011, and Naming the Ruins published in 2014. Two books are forthcoming soon. Dr. Roma has also been the recipient 
of highly competitive research fellowships such as the Asia Leadership Fellows Program of Tokyo, the NUS Asia Research Institute Research Fellowship, and um, Japan Foundation Research Fellowship, among others. She was the 2019 recipient of the Gawad Francisco Balagtas for Poetry in English, a Lifetime Achievement Award from the country's National Writers Union or UMPIL. She is a fellow, a senior fellow of the De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub. So without much further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dina Roma, Professor Dina Roma. Myself. Okay. We can see you and you can hear okay. you now. Okay, so is my audio good? Okay, clear? Yes. Okay. Um, magandang hapun po sa inyong lahat. Uh, good afternoon, friends, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you so much for signing up and joining us in this afternoon's uh, event. I know that the legacy of empire may not exactly be the most enjoyable topic on a gray Saturday afternoon, but um, I guess uh, given the many disruptions in our lives lately uh, and being still in lockdown, it might be good to be reminded that the past has not quite exactly left us. And this has already been uh, said by uh, Dr. Farish Noor and that we might still learn uh, lessons from it. What I'm uh, going to present uh, this afternoon is part of an ongoing uh, work on colonial travel narratives. Uh, and I'm hoping to put it together uh, finally. I've chosen Catherine Mayo's Isles of Fear, particularly as it talk about racialized views of the colonial body, the Filipino and pathogens that like us, we are uh, gravely trying to protect ourselves from. Now, before I proceed, uh, special thanks are in order. I'd like to thank Dr. Fernando Santiago, uh, search uh, director for organizing this event. Uh, and may I note that he's been doing a very good job uh, at promoting uh, search uh, events. And my home department of literature is chair Dr. Genevieve Asenjo and Dr. Carlos Piocos for helping us out this afternoon. And my special thanks, of course, go to Dr. Farish Noor, my co-presenter for this afternoon, uh, for his uh, very dedicated and rather quite inspiring uh, pursuit and promotion of Southeast Asian studies. Um, I'm going to base my talk on, uh, on a study that I have done uh, a couple of years back, and it has already been written up and rather lengthy. So what I'm going to do is uh, maybe read parts of it uh, because um, I don't want to miss really the very specific uh, you know, uh, areas that I want to focus on, given that I promised to do a uh, discourse analysis. So I'll present. In the 1920s, as the Philippines and uh, India intensified their nationalist attempts at independence from the US and British empires, an American woman journalist, Catherine Mayo, would publish two books hostile to the people's struggles by foregrounding the notion of race as proof why independence must not be granted to either population. In the guise of a public health report, the two books relied on earlier scientific publications to stress the contagions and maladies, and thus the imminent threat to the Anglo-Saxon world should the two colonies be granted autonomy. The two books became known as the veritable artifacts of colonial discourse. The Isles of Fear, The Truth About the Philippines, and Mother India were influential among colonial officers. The Isles of Fear was reprinted four times between the years 1925 to 1927, while Mother India went through many reprints and various um, editions from, from the time that it was released and was translated, in fact, into a total of 13 languages that comprise of European and uh, Indian languages 
as well. And by all standards, uh, we can say that uh, they're really uh, bestsellers, top grocers, if I may say. They were endorsed as readings for governance and soon became the basis for subsequent administrative acts designed to thwart the growing clamor for independence in the two colonies. However, as Philippines and India came under attack in Mayo's so-called investigative writing, they also inadvertently served as colonial specimens that revealed the anxieties of inter-imperial relations between the then upstart American empire and the alleged floundering British empire. In the midst of this relation was the US representation of itself as an exemptional empire whose interventionist mechanisms in sanitation, public health and education all captured in the term benevolence soon gained worldwide uh, renowned. The labor of modernity gauged by the recuperation of the colonial body out of the darkness of superstition, death and disease, thus pitted the results of the US empire's mere two decades presence in the Philippine Islands against the century and a half British colonial rule in India. Studies on Catherine Mayer's colonial writings necessarily yoked the Isles of Fear and Mother India together. Uh, Bernie, maybe we can show the slides of the two books. The two books. Yes, okay. The mention of one would always evoke the other, yet while an impressive scholarship has been built on Mother India, the Isles of Fear has remained in the former's shadow, in the former's exegetic shadow. Um, and then maybe we can just go a bit back uh, to the, uh, you have there, uh, yes, uh, so this, uh, this is one of the reviews of Mother India. India is our own worst enemy, which I got from the New York uh, Times. And then uh, the other one uh, is, yeah, to undo Mayor's mischief. So the, the, the engines were rather, uh, uh, they reacted heatedly against the, uh, the release of Mother India. So, uh, and maybe we can focus just on the books. Okay, thank you. So a search for extensive critical studies on the Isles of Fear has led to a few remarks and citations to the book within lengthier works focusing on aspects of Philippine American colonial historiography. Significant reviews on Isles of Fear on the one hand written by American readers of the period have been self-serving affirmation of Mayo's achievement in shedding light in the Philippine on the Philippine question. Moreover, a comparative study of the two books has been attempted back in 1930, but while similarities are admittedly shared by the books, distinct problems nonetheless are laid out in the process. Hence, to collapse the two texts under the same analytical rubric would be a failure in reading the uniqueness or specificities of the colonies as they were governed by the two empires. This paper takes up on the lead to intervene in the literature by focusing extensively on the Isles of Fear. Its aim is to offer a discourse analysis that charts the thematic breeds of the US public health regime in the Philippines. Specifically, this study examines how the trope of the deceased Filipino body and its variant form as embodied in the caciques or the oligarchy are deployed to nullify the cause of Philippine independence movement. It is hoped that by clarifying how these elements bear on each other, a better understanding of Mayo's declared domestic motivation, which means raising the awareness of the American public could be inserted back into the larger imperial project that was meant to include a similar write-up on China and Japan with the overall goal of asserting Westernization as the antidote to the Oriental's ignoble living. Moreover, it is also to show how the notion of race as it is utilized in colonial discourse is a pliable tool as Mayo has shown in both her writings on the Philippines and India. It may be seen as a sliding scale where gradations do not quite signify as an advancement, but as mere gestures toward the impossibility of achieving Anglo-Saxon whiteness and the virtues embodied therein. 
So the four sections of this paper, which I, I will not have time actually to go into, um, address the various aspects that may be productive in reading the Isles of Fear, if at most I can only touch on two sections. So the first section uh, situates uh, the book's production within the aftermath of the Democrats' defeat to the Republicans in the U.S. presidential elections of 1920, which is uncanny because we all know that there is a, uh, a presidential election uh, going on right now. So the power shifted from the Democrats to the Republicans in 1920. Now, this is an important point because it was that time that the Democrats were criticized for devolving too much power and all too soon to the Filipino politicians through the Jones Bill of 1916. Um, now, just compressing this section a bit, there was a second Jones Bill which stipulated an independence without a definite date. And this was finally passed into law by President Wilson on August 29, 1916. It was a victorious historical moment for um, the Philippine Islands as the bill led to the dissolution of the Philippine Commission, whose members were mostly Americans. So there were debates, uh, there were lobbyists, uh, but with the ascendancy of the Republicans, they vowed again to reclaim what was supposedly their lost Philippine colony. So what came after was really the art. In fact, they were they called it the you know the Demo, the Democrats were uh, criticized for the so-called democratic laxness, and uh, the the decision was to put the Philippine Islands on status quo, and the soon after there was the. Um, the decision to send a commission to the islands to study its present conditions and to draw up recommendations. And this was the famous Wood Forbes Commission um, that went on a fact-finding trip. But really, it was just to legitimize uh, finding facts to support the preconception and therefore to push for the delay of Philippine, uh, the granting of Philippine independence. So the findings that came from the commission reified uh, earlier views that went against granting independence to the Filipinos. It instead portrayed the population as happy and loyal, but unclear in their understanding of the responsibilities of independence. The report was anchored on two presumptions. Firstly, that the average Filipino was not keen at all about independence. And second, the possibility of the Philippines being taken over by Japan if the Americans were to let go of the archipelago. So Governor Leonard Wood uh, went back to the Philippines again and traveled for four months. And he was met with an incessant appeal to remedy the situation by taking on the highest position in the islands. He took oath again on October 15, 1921, with a clear goal of restoring U.S. dominance in the archipelago. But faced with the tepid responses from American businessmen and unsettled by the notion that the domestic audience did not possess a good idea of the potential of the Philippines as a market, Wood solicited the aid of writers and publicists, hence Catherine Mayo, to write up on the conditions of the Philippines. Why Mayo figured prominently as the best candidate to undertake the task could best be explained by her solid imperial credentials. Mayo's early writing career, which already manifested a flair for the sensational, was shaped by her family's experience of living in Dutch Guyana, uh, now uh, Suriname, as they joined the bandwagon of Gold Rush. So during the residence there, she began writing short stories and contributing articles on leprosy to the Evening Post that then, taken together, already display an essentialist reading of immutable racial and cultural differences between the settlers and the slaves. What Mayo created from her journalistic effort was, according to historian Paul Kramer, 
a damning imperial indigenous indictment of Filipinization. In over 300 pages, Mayo depicts in essentialist fervor the incapacities of the Filipinos for self-governance. At the outset, she, ass she asserts that the Filipinos do not possess a unitary race, but are comprised of warring tribes. A fragmented nature is at the core of the people's evolutionary impasse. Hence, without the unifying race, spirit, and vision, the common tao, the peasant population, will continue to be at the mercy of the caciques, the oligarchy. So with no one to fight for their welfare and with the clamor for independence, simply a lame excuse for the political warlords to entrench themselves in power, the Tao will remain as the inquit, deceased, and disenfranchised masses they were since the Spanish colonial period. And Mayo was really a strategist. So uh, if we can uh, display the slide, please. Uh, a, uh, uh, yeah, this. So this is the Tao, which is the centerpiece, actually, of, uh, of her book. And it, it shows almost like a defeated uh, native uh, old man, uh, and always this is uh, to what she would refer throughout the book. And when you compare uh, her arguments to Mother India, uh, you would see, uh, Fernie, sorry, can we go to the book? Yes, you have here uh, an Indian woman uh, with uh, holding a baby. And in, in, in the book, uh, she would actually describe you know, pages and pages and pages after pages how the Indian woman is actually, you know, like oversexed, that, uh, that uh, she's, her energies, you know, are all spent just toward uh, this very function. So Mayo's decision to focus on the public health policy as the book's argumentative centerpiece after uh, being enlisted by Governor General Wood in the campaign against the Philippine nationalist movement would not only indicate the increasing anxieties between the local political elite and its colonial mentors, but more precisely underscore the growing disinterest of the US public to its Asia Pacific territory. Mayo's insistence on the book's domestic goal was thus a rhetorical maneuvering to arouse concern among the Americans over the imminent peril of the Anglo-Saxon world faces with the granting of independence to a race whose bodies are carriers of diseases and maladies. With the theme suggested by friends at the Rockefeller Foundation, which collaborated uh, with imperial powers on the research and eradication of Asiatic diseases at the time, Mayo meant to foreground impressive achievements of the US colonial states modernizing interventions in the area of public health while questioning the logic of independence at a time when the Filipinos were enjoying their good prospects under the US rule. So in drawing up the public health report, Mayo relied extensively on the writings of the key colonial builders like Dean Worcester, Leonard Wood, and Victor G. Heiser. She quoted and effectively reiterated earlier writings on the Philippines that circulated racialized readings on the islands. And Dr. Noor, um, terms this as the echo chamber. And in colonial uh, travel theory, uh, you would, uh, this is actually called as the hermeneutic circle that they just go round and round in one circle and never quite, you know, uh, get out of it. So they just quote each other, they cite each other. So the release of the Isles of Fear was an achievement that Governor General Wood himself congratulated Mayo for. So the book created a furor among the Filipino community in the US who accused Mayo of gross misrepresentation of the Filipinos as savages and uncivilized. All this was taking place um, as copies were being distributed around and sent to British colonial officials who were troubled with a similar difficulty in its Indian colony. Liner, uh, Lionel Curtis, a British official and writer, was so impressed 
Rinneus' work that he provided the preface to the British edition of the Isles of Fear. The most impressive support for the book was said to have caused the delay of the granting of independence to the Philippine Islands for another two decades, a feat that Mayo was soon to top with a far more controversial book on India. So in her introduction, Mayo's use of the word report to those Filipinos um, inclined to provide her information tends, uh, lends credence to her goal and writing and affirms the very profession by sh which she has built uh, a name for. Her emphasis on her having, uh, her having traveled free of any encumbrances or alliances, a statement that she repeatedly makes in her prefaces to other works as well, while foregrounding her experience in field investigation sets the books uh, objective tone, and I quote. Finally, I want you to know that I come here as ignorant concerning you as the most uninformed person now in America, that I have no prepossessions, no friendships, no alliances that can in any way influence my judgment, that I come wholly without connections, without any cause or organization, without commitment to any publication or party, and entirely at my own expense as a volunteer whose one hope is to do a bit of work that will serve both sides of the water. For the question is one question, a question of light and duty toward the common good. But we all know it's completely the opposite. No? So Mayo begins her book by citing statistical data to illustrate the dynamic trade activities taking place in the archipelago and locates this uh, via the Dutch, British territories and the hungry Japan um, to hint at other imperial interests. Although Mayo cites the Philippines strategic and commercial advantages to the US, she considers this a secondary really to her concern while building the exclusively human point, the nature and condition of the native people of the Philippine islands that she once delineated in her report on the archipelago she begins to lay down the groundwork for her racialized tirades against Filipinos and hence build the conclusion against the granting of Philippine independence. So Fernie, maybe we can go to that quote. That one quote, yes. So this is the quote, that, the only quote that I am going to uh, put up here on the PowerPoint because this really is, uh, this really already tells so much about the book. So this is from Mayo. What do you mean when you speak of the people of the Philippine Islands? Do you think of them as a political body, a social body, a distinct race? Do you think of them as a minor nation represented by delegates to Washington? The answer Mayo gives is stark and here marks her categorical invitation to the readers to admit there is no such thing as a Filipino race, okay? So I'll now go straight uh, to the, uh, this chapter entitled The Great Physician, uh, as it talks uh, largely about the, the Filipino body politic. So the rhetorical drive of Mayo's expose on the Philippine Islands owes to her interminable representation of the colonized terrain as metonymic of the recuperation of a squalid and disease infected archipelago into a vibrant, healthy and modern territory through the colonial state civilizing regime. At the helm of all these endeavors was Dr. Victor G. Heiser, the Director of Health in the Philippine Islands from 1905 to 1915, who came to the Philippines as Chief Quarantine Officer. He later became the Director of Health, who was well known to have possessed a predisposition for military authority, which he believed was the only way he could get his work accomplished efficiently. So to profess the role of Heiser in building public health and legitimizing uh, its benefits, Mayo begins by cataloging the wretched state of the archipelago in the section, A Great Physician. And this quote is too long, but it just uh, talks about the mortality of the Filipino 
uh, colonial uh, natives uh, for each kind of uh, diseases or illnesses that were prevalent at the time. So the description uh, emphasizes the extent to which the American colonial state has to labor to infuse back, uh, to infuse life back into the territory. So resurrecting this archipelagic graveyard also affirms the scientific gold mine the US was able to exploit as it carved a niche in the burgeoning field of tropical medicine during the period. So disease, death, and contagion proposed various categories of study that demanded experimentation, surveillance, testing, controlling subjects, implementation of new practices that form the colonial sanitary regime. Foremost, it meant to identify, name, and eradicate pathogens that attacked and fed on the Filipino body. Uh, so the following parts are rather the center, uh, uh, my central arguments. No? So writing on the beginnings of American colonial public health policy in the Philippines, Anderson Warwick depicts how the islands have been fashioned into one huge laboratory with makeshift laboratories even uh, operating before Emilio Aguinaldo's arrest in 1901. Although the archipelago virtually became a laboratory for investigation and a rich uh, ground for field trials, the initial scientific interest was not significantly a concern for the native ecology. It addressed the welfare of the white man in the tropics. The crux of the matter was how best the Americans could acclimatize to the conditions in the islands if they were to fully exploit the economic and political possibilities inherent in the territory. Racial degeneration was thus at the forefront of the scientific debate that inquired into the menace the American physiology faces in a tropical climate and the ways by which this can be contravened. So the trajectories in scientific investigation shifted, however, as new findings affirmed that it was not so much the climate or surroundings that endangered the American body, but the Filipino body, which through rigorous scientific investigation was proven to be the vessel for native fauna. With the colonized body reformulated as carriers of diseases and a menace, more than actually the uh, actual government, devising control systems to lessen its contact with the American body was viewed as imperative. So with the attention veering away from studies of colonial conditions to the new contagionist tropical medicine, the colonial governance soon stepped up its efforts to install mechanisms of quarantine and sanitation of the native population. Implementation, uh, implementation of this took concrete forms through surveillance and segregation. Soon the battle with disease became America's greatest colonial campaign that proved to a great degree the colonizers racial resistance and therefore the Anglo-Saxons superiority. During this greatest microbial interest, the Filipino body, according to Warwick, became completely vulnerable and indefensible and entrenched deeply racial notions of governance into the mundane lives of the colonizers and colonized. Okay, so just a few more paragraphs and then I'll conclude. So these racial notions were embodied in the implementation of public health practices and later on unsettled as the process of Filipinization began to gain momentum in the islands. In his widely quoted memoir, An American Doctor's Odyssey, Heiser narrates the Herculean task he faced in the nascent years of public health building so that the Filipinos might reach from personal, uh, from the hell that was to the heaven that might be. I quoted from the memoir. So despite his book being designed as a personal uh, chronicle, Conventions of scientific writing emerge to narrate histories of diseases um, and the impact of controlling epidemics uh, under the most onerous of circumstances whose outcome later on was hailed as a feat. The sterling model of public health and tropical medicine in the Far East. 
Yet Heiser's descriptions were annotated with racial underpinnings that constructed the indigenous body as the prodigious site of maladies. It was for this that he literally entitled the chapter documenting his arrival in the archipelago as washing up the Orient, which justify the need to invade the rights of homes, comers, and parliaments. Okay. So as Mayor lends a critical voice to Heiser's achievements midway her book, by culling from his earlier medical reports, she becomes more insistent in arguing for the adverse effects of Harrison's democratic leadership. Undoubtedly, as the international, at the international level, Heiser's work at the Bureau of Health had given tremendous prestige to the US. Writing in 1906, Heiser celebrated the attention US had earned over Britain for its work on tropical medicine in the Philippines, which she termed as a monument to American ambition and progressiveness. So in a recent study on the colonial public health system in the Philippines, Maria Mercedes Planta cites a note written in 1909 to Heiser uh, from Dr. Fuller Bourne of the Hamburg School of Tropical Medicine, expressing his gratitude while saying that we, the Germans, and all other nations having colonies in the Far East will have to take lessons from the Manila sanitary authorities in dealing with the evils that beset us. So the lower stratum of the indigenous body, the sphere that provided much of the sheer material obsessively scrutinized by the colonial sanitarians and indicted for grossly infecting the environment would never be allowed to evolve along the more abstract mental or intellectual trajectory that the colonial rulers envisioned as the ultimate end of the civilizing mission. Its self-rule has to be perpetually deferred in order to contain its threats. It would remain as Heiser's resistance to the Filipinos, uh, Filipinization movement would prove as the languid flesh of the other. So uh, actually Mayo just goes on uh, in this way and uh, it's really just all a dichotomy of uh, the clean and uh, the dirty. Uh, and in chapter, for instance, um, you have this question from Mayo, how can they stand, or referring to the Filipinos, how can they stand the stress of modern civilization until they get their bodies into shape? So the book continues with emblematic dichotomy of virtue vice in chapters such as the ship and wolves, vultures in the sky, the rottenest thing, the prayer of the living dead uh, to build up into the second half of the book, which simply reiterates the crux of Mayo's report on how the American colonial governance has transformed the war-tone disease-infested archipelago into one of the most modern cities in the world in the brief two decades it has occupied the archipelago, summed up in the great Anglo-Saxon performance. Actually, this is never a fun reading. Uh, so with the conclusion, uh, in teaching Catherine Mayo's um, Mother India, scholar Jyotsna Upal has seen the opportunity to interrogate the assertion that the representational form was never independent of material and ideological forms. By expanding the interpretative canvas to include questions about the power of representation and how they are imbricated in the specificities of historical conditions, a more productive and uncompromising stance can be achieved in reading colonial texts. Mayo's The Isles of Fear, The Truth About the Philippines was hailed as a powerful instrument in restoring the role of the US colonial state in the Philippines with evidence that it was used as a reference material during uh, hearings at the Senate Committee on Territories and Insular Affairs and delaying the granting of independence to the Philippine Islands for another two decades. There is no denying how its contents were accorded authority by leaders. Yet, as seen in the recent scholarship on Mayo, 
Her works were intimately linked in the attempts to position the nascent US empire in the global power constellation. The focus on public health, the image of the deceased native body brought back to life by the colonizer served as the armature to other arguments that privilege a racially exclusive reading of the independent movements in the two colonies as workings of morally bankrupt uh, political elites. By denying parallelism between the American Revolution and the nationalist movement, Mayo saw only the impetuous brown skin mimics assailed by forces beyond his comprehension and who must therefore remain under perennial tutelage for his own good. I stop here. Maraming salamat po. And thank you so much for bearing with me. Thank you, Dr. Roma. Our discussant is an associate professor at the Department of Literature and a research fellow of the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub of De La Salle University. His first book, Affect Narratives and Politics of Southeast Asian Migration, will be published and released by Routledge in 2021. His research interests include literary and cultural studies on migration, gender and sexuality, and Southeast Asia. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Carlos M. Piocos III. Thank you very much, Dr. Fernie. Um, good afternoon. Salamat sore. Magandang hapon uh, to everyone. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank our speakers today, Dr. Farish Noor and Dr. Dina Rama, uh, for the opportunity to respond to your wonderful presentations of books and pathogens Southeast Asia in the eyes of the empire, which to me are critical interventions to the ongoing global conversation on how uh, exactly to decolonize knowledge production especially in Southeast Asia, a region formulated and continually shaped by legacies of 19th century, uh, 19th century Western colonialism and extended as we have seen uh, with Dr. Uh, Roma's presentation to 20th century. Um, some of the things that I would like to uh, uh, reflect on from the two presentations, uh, hopefully uh, would provide inroads to further uh, expand the discussion for the question and answer portion later on. Hopefully, I could give some leads to, uh, and I'm sure uh, we've been seeing some uh, several questions already popping up in the Q and A on our over Zoom. So I would like to uh, uh, first uh, talk about uh, how uh, both of the presentations have demonstrated uh, the ways in which. Uh, um, colonial knowledge productions uh, uh, as this gesture of self-referentiality uh, uh, according to Dr. Uh, Noor and uh, in Dr. Roma's uh, words, uh, they also ventriloquize or uh, go through the process of ventriloquism, uh, which sort of builds up this uh, discursive echo chamber in which they don't just uh, refer to one another as the, uh, legitimate sources, uh, no matter how uh, problematic uh, the statements are, but they also uh, uh, repeat and reiterate those uh, problematic uh, rhetorical performances in their uh, what they uh, uh, what they release as uh, objective knowledge. So I think uh, one of the things that we can reflect upon from this uh, idea, uh, from these two gestures, are um, how we reckon with uh, colonial knowledge. Uh, uh, so we are, uh, I think we are in, uh, we are still in that global movement that uh, seeks to reassess the legacies of these uh, forms of knowledge that we continually cite. Uh, and as a matter of fact, whenever we talk about colonialism and its effects in, uh, even in the Philippines, for example, a lot of the ideas from uh, a lot of the ideas has been so sedimented uh, ideas about uh, the benign phase of colonialism and even the benign phase of uh, educating the natives are still very prevalent. And in many ways, when we look at um, when we look at the historical formation of uh, uh, of education, for example. Uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, still.
in a way there's a good face to this colonialism and i think uh, by continually uh, dialoguing critiquing and reassessing uh, what actually are these legacies uh, can we only really think about or can we really start uh, uh, can we really start the process of decolonization? Um, I'll go back to some of the conversations even uh, during our dry run. Uh, I think Dr. Roma and uh, Dr. Noor has mentioned how many of these writings that we uh, take as uh, knowledge, as objective knowledge, are also framed as travel writings by people who really never traveled. So that's a very interesting insight that I've got from our earlier conversation, because if you look at, for example, even how uh, Mayo has framed her voice as, uh, uh, as somebody intervening into uh, uh, public health discourse or on colonial islands, uh, she was kind of uh, uh, popping herself as somebody who's, who has no uh, uh, alliances, who has no uh, interest, but who only belongs to the world. And much of this, uh, I think much of the colonial writings are also as the veneer of this, uh, 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 what we would uh, probably uh, uh, think now as a form of uh, cosmopolitans that uh, have, uh, that, that do not have any alliances, but whose alliances are work is to the world. That's why their knowledge uh, are credited at, uh, and their writings are uh, taken until now up to such uh, up to such a level of esteem, which uh, kind of, uh, for example, I think what we should also uh, have to start reassessing uh, and have to uh, really reflect upon uh, whether they are really, uh, whether they have really left the shores where they come from because of how they frame uh, the places that they went through. Because um, uh, not everybody who travels uh, uh, are, 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 act, uh, are actually guaranteed that their visions of the world will be much wider. So not everybody can actually be, not everybody who can cross borders are actually cosmopolitan. So I think uh, 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 that's one of the things that uh, I, I, I'm reflecting upon uh, from the two presentations. And um, so uh, I'll go to uh, some of the questions that uh, uh, I have now. So for Dr. Noor, uh, I would uh, I, you talk about how uh, uh, American writers in 19th century visiting and writing about Southeast Asia as this sort of disavowal or sort of this this sort of actively dissociate themselves from the uh, European imperialist identity, that they're different from British, they're different, uh, basically different from, uh, uh, from other uh, European forces. Uh, 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 could, you, um, could you talk a little bit later about uh, what that strategy entails, uh, how it operates in the writing, uh, uh, just a little bit, or, and uh, what are its implications in uh, understanding the position of uh, America during 19th century and their interest in, in the region. And to Dr. Roma, um, uh, in your presentation, you hinted about uh, how travel writings and colonial writings are also uh, very gendered. And I think in some of your writings about uh, 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 colonial uh, women uh, writers uh, writing about uh, you, uh, white women writers, uh, uh, writing travel writings, uh, they're very gendered. And uh, I, would, uh, I would like to also circle back to Dr. Noor's point earlier about how these texts are very confessional. And I'm wondering how different uh, uh, gendered is among these uh, Western colonialist writers uh, and how uh, gender figures in, in their uh, in the way they confess about uh, their own, uh, 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 in the way they confess about their uh, the limits of uh, the limits of how they see the world they are visiting, how they see the colonial, uh, the colonial, uh, the colonized islands of Southeast Asia. So uh, I think that would uh, that's uh, some of the my few uh, 
responses to to the presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Carlos, would you like me to reply immediately? Uh, uh, perhaps, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, before we go to the uh, official right. Q&A. Uh, okay, so very briefly, I think um, what is genuinely fascinating about the writings by Americans from the late 18th to the first half of the 19th century is this very stark you know, contrast which they continually refer to or, or bring to bear in their writings about how they are different, they're different, they're different. Um, uh, and But at the same time, this difference is not simply a political difference in the sense that America is a republic that was once a colony. And so there's this constant uh, repetition of the idea that because we were a colony, we are not here to colonize. Yeah. So there's a that difference on an ideological level, political level. But underlying that is actually a difference in the way in which white Americans perceive themselves vis-a-vis -vis their other Europeans. Because again, we must remember, in the first half of the 19th century, America still has not experienced the large migration of other Europeans from Central Europe and uh, Mediterranean Europe. You know, so we don't have... We, we've yet to see the arrival of Greeks, Italians, uh, Irish, or what have you. So this early America is a Protestant Anglo-Saxon America. And what I find interesting, I'll cite one book, uh, Robert Fitch Taylor's uh, book, which is an account of the American attack on Sumatra. Yeah? Um, as the Americans leave America and they sail to Southeast Asia, of course, at the time, America had not become a Pacific power because it hasn't conquered California yet. So they have to sail south. So they sail past the West Indies and they go past Brazil and, and all the Spanish and, and, and Portuguese colonies. And it's actually very interesting that this is where we encounter the first difference because Taylor is absolutely horrified with the Catholics because, you know, writing as a white American Anglo-Saxon Protestant, for him, Catholicism was basically almost paganism for him, you know, and, and his, his, his first racist statements are actually not directed at Asians because they haven't arrived in Asia yet. So he starts with the Spanish and the Portuguese and, and, and he's writing again for an American audience back home who he assumes are white Protestants like him. So he says, you know, looking at their rites and rituals, th th these are not Christian, these are pagan rituals. And, and then it gets more and more bizarre as his vessel hits towards Southeast Asia. And then he encounters India. And for the first time, then you meet non-Christians. And so we have multiple levels of differentiation further and further and further away. And I think this is what I find interesting about these books. And they go back to the theme of, you know, comfort in traveling. Not everyone travels. You can actually, you know, it, we know this in the age of bad, cheap tourism, right? Uh, tourists can go all over the world and wherever they are, they want to eat their McDonald's. You know, they, they don't want to eat the local food. They don't really care about the local music. You know, you, you fly all the way to Bali, but you look for a pizza hut. And, and so these early 19th century travelers were behaving in a very similar way that he sought comfort. Another thing I found interesting about the Americans was that they were constantly looking for fellow English speakers uh, and, and if not American, at least British, you know, uh, who are Protestants. So in the writings of Warren uh, Reynolds uh, uh, Taylor, they were overjoyed when they reached China on their journey because at least there were some American missions there. So they could, they could talk about home. Um, so there's something deeply parochial about these writings. Uh, you know, you know, uh, um, you know, the word kampong comes to mind. You know, they're really in their villages. They never left their kampong, even though they are thousands of miles away from from the North American continent. And I think for us Southeast Asians who've been burdened with this label of being parochial and backward and kampong ourselves, well, it's actually very interesting for us to see the kampong nas of these Europeans when they travelled because they never left their kampongs either. So. This then raises the question of, do these communities actually communicate with one another? And I think this comes out in Dina's uh, uh, presentation. They don't, that's the point. You, you, you gather data from the native other, but only to appropriate it and interpret, interpret it ac to, according to your own register. So does communication ever really happen? 
And I think in most, in, in many instances, actually by the 19th century, it doesn't. There was probably more communication in the 17th century when, remember, Europeans were still inclined to, for instance, marry native women. And so you have Anglo-Indian communities in Bengal, mixed Eurasian families. But by the time we get to the 19th century, with these very strict gender and racial divides, you don't have that kind of very close, intimate, interpersonal relations anymore. We talk behind nationalities. You know, so the American is talking to the Filipino, the British is talking to the Burmese. And once you assume these national characters, genuine human dialogue begins to break down. So I think that's a, that's a very interesting observation that we as Southeast Asian scholars can actually make about these European writings. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Piokos, uh, for the questions. So I'll proceed to um, uh, I'll proceed the, to reply or respond to the question that you posed earlier. And uh, I'm grateful that you did because my work actually centers uh, or focuses on uh, on gender. Uh, uh, when we talk of empire, uh, we would always talk of male con uh, male conquest, and I think that's uh, really the metaphorical. Uh, relation, no? the, the analogy. But the reason why I focused on uh, uh, particularly on the American uh, colonial travel narratives written by women at the turn of century was basically to investigate what was supposed to be harmless, no? harmless uh, texts or narratives. And when I say harmless, these are letters, these are diaries, uh, these are very informal uh, writings uh, or annotations, but when I look actually into the quality or into the nature of writing of these women who were here uh, in the early 1900s uh, on account of their husband's work, uh, one was the wife of uh, the famous, uh, one was the wife of an anthropologist, uh, Albert Jenks, uh, she was, uh, her name was Maud Huntley Jenks, she actually helped in the editing of uh, the research notes, you know, up to the point of putting together uh, this, uh, this, uh, his books. You know? And uh, in the letters, you would see how he actually was very much part of the um, ethnographic research. And sometimes the descriptions there, you know, it, it is just a, a daily entry into a journal, but you would see how the work of empire, you know, uh, uh, goes deep into the domicile. For instance, as uh, she went around uh, trying to collect um, earrings, uh, gold earrings, because at that time they were intricately uh, being made by hand you know, of uh, the, the colonial natives. And she just gathered everything. She just gathered everything because for her, she felt, of course, on account of her husband's work, that uh, this uh, would form part of the research of the artifacts. And she, you know, she would just go from one house to another and would ask for, for these things. No? Uh, but she didn't realize that it can be probably a heirloom, it can be probably a cultural, uh, you know, uh, treasure, for, which, is, uh, which uh, it really was in the first place. No? So these this narratives, they were set aside uh, as unofficial narratives. Uh, and they were not really taken uh, or not given attention simply because they're the writings of women. But in fact, if you go deep into the construction of this text, you would find out how, in fact, they are more harmful in many ways. You know? uh, they would employ, for instance, native boys into their households. And every day they would make them recite text, English uh, lines, until finally their tongues are rehearsed to the accent that they wanted uh, them to, you know, to pronounce in. And that's, I mean, that's really in violation of your own identity. So yes, uh, and the reason why they actually were able to come to the Philippines is because right after the very bloody 1898 war, uh, there was supposed to be a rebuilding of some sort. And they needed these women. They were actually part of the material empire. You know? uh, and yes, 
and that's also the reason why Catherine Mayo's book emerges as very different from the rest, because in the study of colonial travel narratives written by women, often the tone is suffused with acceleration. For instance, the landscape or, you know, it's really about the sentiment. It's nothing to, to be taken seriously. But with Mayo, she really did, uh, contrary to all of these things, she wanted to be taken seriously. She wanted her work to be known as investigative reporting. Uh, and uh, in that sense, I think she, she succeeded. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the colonial officers or governance at that time were really to the point. They wanted someone like Mayo, who at you know, the surface seemed so objective, seemed so unattached, because she's a woman. I mean, she doesn't have anything to do actually with empire building. But that's but that's not actually how you you know how the book turns out. You know, actually, it's I mean, if you read through the three hundred uh, pages, it's it's almost like you want to slap yourself. I mean, why do you even want to read these things? But I mean, as as Dr. Noor said, we have to. You know, we have to. Uh, it still appears, you know, on the net. There are people asking, you know, why is there such fear over uh, Catherine Mayo's The Isles of Fear or this and that, but there is no systematic study or accounting of the very basis why she actually managed to write these things and even to make out of that book such a bookseller among the imperial rulers. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Um Carlos, uh, Fernando, do you mind if I just add one thing to, to what Dina has said? No problem. Yes, uh, uh, I I think Dina. Um, there's also another very famous uh, a British uh, woman author who we are all familiar with, which is Isabella Bird, of course. Yeah. Uh, and Isabella Bird, and I think we, here we see some very interesting parallels between Isabella Bird and and Catherine Mayo, because both are basically apologists for empire. Yeah. And I think this is uh, something that 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 we need to appreciate fully. When we read Isabella Bird, for instance, when she writes about, you know, the Golden Kersinese, about the Malay Peninsula, it is very clear that she's deeply grateful for the presence of empire there. I mean, we have passages where, where, where she says, had it not been for the colonial police, these natives would have killed all of us, you know? Um, so there's that. And what I find really interesting, and, and this goes back to Carlos's question uh, as well, is this very interesting double play of gender roles. Because on the one hand, as a white woman, a British woman or an American woman, you know, you, you come within the patriarchal structure of your respective society. You're a white woman who needs to be protected by white men. But by virtue of being abroad as an adventurous white woman, you are in a sense more masculine than the native males who've been colonized. And this comes out a lot in the writings of Isabella Bird, where she disparagingly talks about the rulers of Southeast Asia. They are weak, they are weak. So it's so in a sense, she she is on two registers as a white woman beneath, you know, in the white patriarchal order, but in the racial order, superior to all Asians, including Asian males. And I think this is a fascinating dynamic. Uh, and hence you get that missionary zeal and that, you know, strength of character, uh, which unfortunately today then gets, gets, you know, rehashed in Hollywood movies, you know, and then we have Jodie Foster playing, you know, Anna Leon Owens in The King and I and stuff like that. And this is somehow refed to us, Southeast Asians as, you know, models to emulate without our own people understanding the context of you know the writing of a, a, a novel like the king and i you know story like you know um uh and uh, lono one's story yeah and and maybe to add um uh is it okay uh for me yes of course yeah. Uh, while I was doing research uh, on, on these books, because there, there have been uh, quite a number of titles that I've uh, gone back to, I mean, in the, in the archives, and part of a bigger part of the research I did a few years back, 
um, in Singapore, and they have a very good archive, the Southeast Asian archive. And I saw photos. I was, I think, more fascinated with photos uh, because they really uh, tell you a lot. I mean, in, in the black and white, gray, uh, grayish uh, tone, uh, there was this woman. Um, she she was uh, standing before uh, the what was supposedly a jail station uh, for the guerrillas. Uh, and she was preaching and she was in her Victorian attire and she was uh, carrying this uh, parasol, this umbrella. And she was, uh, you know, in one hand, the Bible. And you have all uh, the, the, the guerrillas uh, who were, uh, you know, captured uh, just listening to her. And I said, wow, you know, uh, just with that alone, you can already say so many things. And, and even like probably uh, I'll be telling this one of my dream um, essays or chapters to write about would be how Emilio Aguinaldo was perceived by the American women over time because there's a lot many things that I read that were so you know there were uh, women uh, preachers who went and preached uh, you know with him uh, for during the time of his incarceration at the point uh, until the point when he was actually already trying to enjoy some of the amenities of being and you know imprisoned uh, so these are things that, that are still out there. And um, I don't think it can ever be exhausted. The archive can never be exhausted. It really just depends on who will make use of them and how, you know, uh, I think strong your, your, your commitment is and your advocacy to, you know, to own, to own this archive, to rewrite uh, history. Okay, uh, Dr. Piokos, do you have any reactions? I think, I think uh, that will do. Uh, and we, we, are, we have uh, several uh, questions on Q&A that we can, uh, I think we, can, we should probably go there. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Piokos, for your insights and your questions. So I'll now turn to the questions in the Q&A box and the chat box. We have more than 10 actually, and some of which have been addressed. <laughs> So I will prioritize the questions that have not yet been answered. But let me begin with a question in the chat box from uh, Dr. Jenny Vivasenho. Can our panelists cite dominant and prevailing decolonizing methods used currently employed by our Southeast Asia writers and scholars in the region and abroad in engaging with these colonial knowledge production? Hmm. <laughs> Okay. Uh, can I uh, can I begin? Of course. Um, I think there's always that trap somewhere. If you look for a decolonizing method, uh, necessarily it will always bring you back to the origin of that knowledge. Um, for me, I my my uh, focus has been uh, colonial uh, travel narratives or theory, in fact. And theory, I think, has so many conflicts or so many tensions uh, in it. Uh, I remember one time uh, when I presented a, a paper before a group of uh, uh, British scholars uh, looking into travel uh, theory, and I made the mistake, or I don't know if it was a mistake, uh, but I did state that you know the current post-colonial travel theory is an apologia by empire to, uh, to the colonized uh, nations or territories because they need to make an accounting of the violence that they have done uh, you know, in the past, but it can never be exhausted. So, I mean, there are efforts, there are attempts, and there should be continuing attempts uh, you know, there are already uh, ways uh, proposed in, in the writing of travel narratives uh, that would celebrate the difference of culture instead of just, you know, uh, focusing on the radical dif uh, differences of, of, of these two cultures. But I think it is really just being sensitive, you know, a, a sensitive register uh, when writing would be, you know, uh, the first uh, step 
in all of this? Maybe Dr. Noor has something to say. Um, <clears throat> well, just, just to add to that, um, can, can I be uh, somewhat cheeky and blunt here? And, and, and I'll, I'll frankly state that it, I am worried about what I think has become a kind of you know, decolonizing bandwagon. Yeah. Uh, and that's because we live, as we know, in the age of Zoom and Facebook and Instagram, mm. and everyone wants to be cool and do the cool thing. Uh, and, and, you know, admittedly, decolonization is cool at the moment. Um, but I, I'll be blunt. I'm not a cool guy. I'm the most boring human being I know. I'm just an <laughs> academic. And what I do is, you know, because I was interviewed by a university radio station, and they, they, they asked a, a very similar question. And, you know, they wanted me to to somehow classify or label the kind of work that I do. So I have two answers. One, I don't like this labeling because as we know, we are all in silos. Academics, you know, we, yeah. we struggle against our silos. And, and, and I think this is the opportunity where we can get out of our silos, which is why I really appreciate, you know, Dina's work because I, I'm a political historian, Dina's a literary critique, and this is where we have those interconnections. And this is a project that cannot be done by one discipline mm -hmm. and by a particular set of academics. It's a collective work that goes on and on and on and on and on. And, but it's a wonderful opportunity for literature, history, political history, political sociology, anthropology, all to come together. Uh, and we don't need to name these things because once we do that, then next thing you know, you have factionalism in schools, and then we'll be fighting the Thirty Year War between ourselves. You know, we'll be we'll be breaking into tribes, and 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 I don't see the point. All I do is I try to do as best as I can, proper, yeah. correct historical accounting, and I always tell my students, this work is not cool. It's boring. It's boring, but it is hugely important. And it is as important as your political economy, as your economic history, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to, to, to prescribe a method. I don't care what method you do. A political economist and an economic historian will be doing things very differently from me. But I learn so much from economic historians who look at the economic history of colonization in Southeast Asia. None of us are making claims that, oh, our analysis is better than yours, but we learn from one another. And I think this, this is why I, I, I applaud if, you know, efforts like this. This is a fantastic example to show that we can actually bring political historians, literary theorists all sure. together and, and have these really rich discussions um, mm -hmm. with, without any particular discipline or school of thought saying we are the one. Uh, I'm certainly not the one, yeah? Uh, I don't know the answers. I'm looking for the answers myself. I think uh, also going back to uh, the topic of the webinar of books and passions, uh, with the presentations, uh, there is enough assertion uh, to say that, you know, uh, no books are written in a vacuum. No? Not only books, but any cultural uh, artifact, any cultural production. There is always something, an ideology, a belief, a worldview that will push it into existence. And I think as scholars, our duty, hence I say as an ob obligation, uh, literary and cultural studies, um, you know, our, our obligation is really to look into it, you know, to look into, to, to, to see the ramifications of the text. We can read it, of course, uh, you can uh, have it as part of your syllabus, but always, you know, make sure that there is enough, uh, you know, um, how do you say, examination, scrutiny. I do that with my Southeast Asian literary uh, history course. Uh, we take up one novel, but, you know, we do not stop talking about what is happening? What is the socio-political context within the novel? How, how come one character is acting this way? Uh, the motivations, everything, you know, because there is no stop to asking questions. And that is what is important. When you begin to ask questions, then you're on the way to finding answer, whether it's valid or not. So, well, before we proceed to the next question in the Q&A box, I, I just want to add that in my discussions with the affiliates and fellows of uh, the Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, uh, well, we've talked about the issue of uh, decolonization. And one insight is that 
in, in Southeast Asia in particular, decolonization is not just a theory. It is a lived, it is a lived experience. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, um, the next question comes from Dr. Antoinette Arogo. So thank you very much, Dr. Noor, Dr. Roma, and Dr. Piocos. I understand Dr. Noor's talk as a concentration of Orientalism or colonialism as a structure of discursive production, discourse as a system admitting certain knowledges as valid and excluding others, or colonial echo chamber, reinforcing colonialism as a structure of capitalist material exploitation, where the Orient is specifically Southeast Asia. If the imperative for reconsidering Orientalism after Said is the long 19th century, how do we not just write back to, but write the empire mm -hmm. towards decolonization, what paradigm of, to borrow from De Sousa Santos, epistemologies of the South emerges? What is the role of locality, of history, of the literary in developing such a paradigm. Um, can I give a very quick uh, reply to that? I think in, in the kind of work that we are doing, particularly Dina and myself, and this was very clear in Dina's presentation, what, what we are doing is really, we are rewriting the history of empire. And so when I read you know, Crawford, when I read uh, 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 Bickmore, when I read uh, Raffles, like I said, I don't read Raffles for knowledge of Southeast Asia, but I read mm. Raffles for the knowledge of the East India Company. So what effectively is happening is that I'm actually writing a history of Western colon uh, colonialism. I'm writing a history of Western colonial capitalism and the workings of Western colonial capitalism. So what we are doing is basically we are writing the history of the West. And that's where the rewriting happens. We are actually writing the history of the West from a non-Western perspective. And this is why this engagement is crucial because I mean, the great thing about this is that especially for historians and literary analysts uh, like, like Idina and myself is we don't even have to go to the West anymore because the West is already here. It's already in the books that we have on our shelves. So, so and that history can be, you know, an objective critical, you know, history that, 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 really reveals reveals you know the workings of all these power structures and hierarchies and 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 i think that's part and parcel i don't i because again my worry and 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 i'll state this uh, one more time in the initial stages particularly in the 70s yeah when Orientalism, Said's Orientalism became popular, that coincided with a, a, a lot of nativist tendencies uh, in activism and in academia. Like we must write our history, our, you know, we, we must to redefine our identity. My worry about that is, is that one, it falls back on the politics of authenticity and two, it blocks us, it traps us. It traps us because does it mean that Southeast Asians can only write about Southeast Asia? I would be horrified if someone said, oh, you know, you're a Southeast Asian, so just focus on your region because that's what you're good at. No, I'm going to write a history of the West. I'm going to write a history of the West. And I'm writing a history of the West by focusing on the history of Western imperialism, you know, and that makes me a global scholar and an international scholar. Let's reclaim this, my friends, you know, let's re reclaim this and not allow ourselves to be boxed in by these, you know, again, labels and categories. So, so it's related to the earlier question as well of, of methodologies. I don't think there is a right one, but, but it's a work in progress. It's a constant, you know, if, uh, thing that's happening actually on so many levels at the same time. Um, just a say a uh, comment. Uh, I think you know all this uh, search for the you know decolonizing system, decolonizing uh, methodology. Um, I mean, I love theory. I read theory, but there is a limit to theory. Um, and again, if you look for a methodology or a framework, uh, it is again lending power to something, uh, lending uh, you know power to the words of another. And I mean that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, again, you can just have the text there. You can study it. Uh, and with your own funded experience, with your own knowledge of things, you know, it's really making, for me, it's really just 
getting a feel you know of of the ground it's it's not necessarily you know this will probably make me unpopular <laughs> among you know the critics or or critical theories but it's really just being in touch with what you have there before you know you can even go out and then look for what you feel is a proper or uh, an appropriate framework within uh, through which to study uh, something. You know, and that's what I always tell my students whenever they write a research paper or a dissertation or a uh, you know like master's thesis. I say, do not lend your work. Do not give your work to the people that you read in books. You know, you make, it, uh, you, you act as if you are in conversation with them, but you do not need to litter, you know, your pages with, with their names. But anyway, yes. Okay, we have another question from Catalina Tiu to Dr. Dina Roma. Mayo's book came out in 1925. If she were alive today, what do you think would she say about Southeast Asia now? I don't think she would reach the present time. <laughs> I mean, as, uh, I don't, I mean, if she wrote it today, I wonder if uh, there's going to be any, you know, uh, publishing house who would even, you know, that would even take on the book. Uh, or, or I don't even know if there would be someone, uh, enough like Mayo, or with the intentions of Mayo, with the political persuasions or ideological persuasions of Mayo, who would really go to that uh, length, you know, uh, of writing one uh, in, in the first place, you know, uh, the independence has already been granted. But what I'm saying is, it was a different time, okay? And they needed the services of Mayo. So ours is a different context. Uh, these days. You know, actually, that's very uh, relevant, uh, Dr. Santiago, because yesterday, if I may mention this, uh, I know the, uh, Karina Bolasco uh, of the Ateneo uh, Press uh, is, is present. And then uh, she told me that she's very interested uh, in, in the Isles of Fear. In fact, uh, she has the copy and she has even asked like one, uh, she was thinking, you know, of having a local edition uh, of, of the book. But uh, I think uh, someone, uh, another uh, publisher, told her that it's not, you know, worth it uh, to have it uh, published uh, these days. But I don't know. Maybe uh, Karina, if you're out there, you can maybe uh, write a few lines. Okay. So shall we proceed to the next question? So it says here, compared to the Spanish in the Philippines, can we say that the Dutch gave more value to the study of the pre-colonial past of Indonesia, especially that Indonesia, the Indonesian archipelago is a series of patchwork of kingdoms? Uh, <clears throat> okay, I, I, I'm assuming that that question is directed to me. Um, and the answer is yes, but for some very interesting and very important reasons. And remember, it wasn't just the Dutch, but also the British during the period of the occupation of Java from 1811 to 1816. Now, um, the Dutch and the British uh, were, were very keen to um, excavate the early pre-colonial history of Java in particular uh, for two reasons. One, um, by the time of the Dutch and British occupation of Java, uh, the socio-political reality and the socio-economic reality of Java and many parts of Indonesia was that these were Muslim societies. And, and part and parcel of the process of colonization was to somehow uh, go back to the pre-Islamic past of Java in particular, and to say, these people were once great, uh, but no longer. 
uh, and hence uh, the desire to promote and project the pre-Islamic Hindu-Buddhist past as a, as a very interesting form of you know, contemporary othering of the present. You negate the actual reality on the ground by harping back on the past. And this comes very clear when you read uh, the writings of Raffles in particular, because when Raffles uh, talks about you know, the Hindu antiquities of, of Java, he makes this claim that you know, um, Java should rank in the Western mind as high as Egypt, right? uh, an ancient Egypt, pharaonic Egypt. Um, and then he wanted you know, all these Javanese artifacts to be brought back to England and to be put into the museum. Um, so it's a very interesting way of, of studying the pre-colonial past to excavate you know, the, 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 the history of the other to prove that the other has become degenerate. Right. And this is the term that Raffles actually used. He, he calls them the degenerate Javanese. They have degenerated over time. They were once great, but no longer. Like the Egyptians, they were once great, but no longer. And so here comes the West. The West comes to restore your antiquities, to rediscover the things you've forgotten, to rediscover your temples, and to, and to promote them to the world because you guys, you 19th century Southeast Asians, you can't do it anymore. So as in the case of Dina's presentation, you know, um, you can't take care of your health, you can't clean your homes, you can't uh, uh, be hygienic. So we are here to do it for you. So we clean up everything. We clean up your past, we clean up your homes, we clean up your bodies. Uh, and so Empire then becomes this restorative project. Yeah. But, but again, my friends, let's remember, all, all empires will have some kind of discourse of legitimation like this, right? Uh, you know, you, we, we are familiar with like, you know, Operation Freedom or whatever. You don't have an Operation Robin Steel because no empire will admit to what it does. So there's always a need to have a, a kind of discourse of legitimation. And in the case of the Philippines, it was sanitation and healthcare. In the case of Java and Indonesia, it was the restoration and the protection of the past. Okay. Thank you. We have a few more questions. The next one is uh, from an anonymous attendee. Good afternoon. As a colony itself, may I, may I ask if there are reasons as to why the United States was, would still create prejudicial and toxic viewpoints on colonies in Southeast Asia during the 19th century and during the shift of power to local governments? Was it the influence of the British Empire? Then would like to answer. I think because um, we have to look at how um, the U.S. as an empire, in fact, as an uh, starting uh, an upstart of an empire, was trying to represent itself. Um, first, uh, in the history of uh, the Philippine colonization, they weren't really sure about. Uh, you know, getting the Philippines as a territory. They had to go through it by trials uh, and errors. Uh, but the fact is when there was already, uh, when they've already set up their, their, their systems, um, they felt that there was an overall mission and that is the benevolent, uh, you know, the, the benevolent uh, assimilation. And you know, we all know very well, historian or not, that it didn't go uh, that way. So it was trying to, for me, you know, uh, it was trying to hold on uh, to a territory that would or could eventually define them as an empire out of the ordinary. And this, I think uh, you've seen uh, in, in my analysis of uh, Catherine Mayo's. Uh, mm. Mayo was citing one, uh, one accomplishment after another of how the, the sanitation regime was a success uh, in the Philippines. But at the same time, on account of that success, they really had to you know, put down the Filipinos. They really had to see it as a non-human body and just as a source of study of all sorts of microbes, of pathogens. And not even because they wanted you know, sincerely for the Filipinos to, to, to become healthy, well-thinking, um, bodies but you know it's a kind of roundabout way but, but also to protect their interest in the islands mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So the dichotomy has to stay. I mean, that's their very uh, that's their very language. Otherwise, there's no reason actually why uh, they had to continue with uh, with such uh, efforts. I think also this dichotomy goes back to the very genesis of America itself, yeah. um, and and though we should not forget that throughout the 19th century there there were very strong anti-imperialist lobbies in America. There was the American yeah. anti-imperialist, uh, you know, movement. But unfortunately, and, and I think it's very hard to deny this, from the very genesis of America itself, that, in, that externalization has already happened. Let's just remember that when America, you know, the 13 colonies rise up and become, you know, declare themselves independent, black slaves were not citizens. Yeah. And crucially, even more uh, uh, interestingly, is that Native Americans were not citizens. So you, you start with this, you start with the birth of a republic on, the, on, on, on a land where the natives of that land are not citizens of this new republic. They are not oh. citizens, right? And so in a sense, you could say that, well, some people, activists have said that you know, America is basically built on the graveyard of the native nations of, of North America. So like it or not, that, that, if you like, the original sin was already there in the very founding of the Republic itself. Uh, a very good book uh, to look at this is, is um, um, John Ellis's Founding Brothers uh, that looks at the foundational years of, of America when he looks at the first post, uh, post-colonial generation of American leaders who were really you know, debating this. How do we build this nation when we know that actually this land is not ours? Uh, so... Um, I strongly recommend that if, if anyone's interested. Founding Brothers by, by Ellis. Okay. And, uh, well, questions are still pouring in, but yes. unfortunately, we have very limited time. But I think we can accommodate one last question from uh, Maria Karina Bolasco. Ah, okay. okay. So the question is, after being molded in the Western literary canon prescribed in our schools for centuries and simultaneously heavily and constantly exposed to Western fiction exported to our countries, why have we not resolved to read one another's literature? While Western publishers now say it's the Asian writer century, it is still Western publishers refereeing and deciding which works are outstanding Asian works exactly. and should be translated. Mm -hmm. And that is the only way we can, back, uh, we can get to read each other's work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's still empire at work, if I may say so. Yep. <laughs> I mean, industries are, are, you know, behind industries are capitals, you know, uh, the capitalists and, and the book industry is no exception. That's all I could uh, say. Um, Maybe I can, I, yeah, okay, go ahead, Dr. Uh, just, just, just to add to that, while I completely agree that, you know, and, and I agree with Dina as well, there is a whole political economy, not only behind the book industry, but also the university industry. Yeah, let's let's be frank. Yeah, um, but while there is a political economy and we need to 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 negotiate our way around that, and and it's very important to to read these these books, you know. But also remember one thing: when we read even the Western classics, right? Um, um, we today read them differently. Like I said, I'm a very boring guy. I still love my Jane Austen, but there is no way that we post-colonial subjects today can read Jane Austen the way she intended to be read. Because when you find out that her heroes, the, the, the Mr. Bingley's and the Mr. Darcy's, you know, and they say, oh, he makes 20,000 pounds a year from his estates in the West Indies. Well, that means he's a slave owner. You know, he's a slave owner. So when we read Jane Austen today, you know, her heroes, you know, come under our contemporary criticism. And so every generation gives birth to a new interpretation of Jane Austen. So again, I'm always wary. I don't want us to come to a point where, you know, um, we completely reject, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Western canon because rejecting it doesn't mean that, you know, it's destroyed. It stays as strong. We need to critique it. But I also don't want to fall into the other trap of saying that, oh, because we're Asians, we need to read Asian and eat Asian and dress Asian and all that because in the end, then we become 19th century stereotypes, you know. So we are caught now in this very interesting juncture of our history where literally we can be whatever we want. So let's not trap ourselves. You know, we, we have to live with 400 years of stereotypes. For heaven's sakes, let's not, let's not reconstruct these stereotypes. You know, let's, let's be ambitious 
in our goals and let's be brave in our criticism. Um, can I briefly answer Darren Mangado's uh, question? Oh, of course. Of yes. Course uh, so Darren, <laughs> I hope you're doing well in Japan. But anyway, for the question, how did the Filipino educated uh, elite accommodate, uh, accommodate uh, Mayo's uh, book at the time? Um, I did. I, I did not choose to read actually uh, the the reviews uh, you know written about uh, Mayo, uh, but there was one uh, the the America the the Filipino community the educated Filipino community were so angry uh, at Mayo, and I think uh, you know it it's it was because the book hurt them more than the common tao that was the centerpiece you know, of, uh, of Mayer's book. And they were uh, being educated and actually belonging uh, to the cacique or to the oligarch, to the, you know, uh, which was again um, set up by Mayo as one of the enemies of the uh, common tao. So for, for them, it was really, Mayer's book was a gross misrepresentation. And to say that the Filipinos do not have a unitary race, uh, that that went, you know, really, it was like a dagger right into the heart of this, uh, you know, this group of Filipinos. Okay, so we'll end the open forum there. Do you have any parting words for the members of the audience? Let's start with uh, Professor Dina. Uh, parting words. <laughs> okay, um, well, Again, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, in this afternoon's event. And I hope that this is not going to be the last. Uh, you have, of course, uh, the Southeast Asian Research uh, Center and Hub, uh, who's responsible for putting this uh, very wonderful uh, events and occasions. So uh, we have to continue on being critical. You know, uh, that's the only way that uh, we maybe can avoid the traps, you know, whatever they are or wherever they are located. It can be a bit difficult, but, you know, uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Professor yes. Farishnur? Uh, I simply second everything Dina says because everything <laughs> Dina says is right. <laughs> Okay. okay. So on behalf of the Southeast Asia Research Center and, and Hub, I'd like to thank Professor Dina Roma, Professor Farish Noor, Professor Carlos Piocos, and of course, Professor Jen Asenho for joining us this afternoon. Before we close the webinar, I would like to invite everyone to our next event, which is a webinar in celebration of Cambodia Day 2020. That's on Monday, November 9, from uh, 2 p.m. Manila time. And the title of the lecture is Cambodian Independence Day, the evolution of its significance through different Cambodian political regimes by uh, Duong Keo of the University of Phnom Penh, Cambodia. So to, to our guests, thank you for jo joining us. It has been a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Stay safe. Yes, uh, okay. <laughs> thank you guys.